Uh, U.S. affairs analyst Ross Feingold, who joins us live from Taipei. Uh, there's so many questions uh, to be answered here, Ross. Um, but what does this tell us about extremism and the internationalization of it? I mean, this, is, this has gone from the U.K. to the U.S., yeah, it's, it's obviously a global phenomenon. Uh, the internet makes it easy for people to access information, uh, how to perpetrate attacks, uh, work with others possibly, although that remains to be seen in this particular case, whether he was a lone wolf or working with others as part of some kind of conspiracy remains to be seen uh, what, what the relevance of the two arrests of the teenagers in the UK is. Uh, and it also shows that uh, houses of worship, regardless of, of the faith, uh, do need to take into account security issues. And uh, it's not really possible to have a, an open facility where people could just stroll in. I mean, in my own experience, uh, I was a founding chairman uh, of a synagogue here in Taiwan. And, and certainly, uh, we have to be cognizant of security issues in, in how we uh, maintain the facilities. And, and on that very point, do you think uh, places of worship in the U.S. are uh, ha have enough security? It's an interesting question. This, in some ways, will vary with the faith because there are a number of different uh, uh, religions or uh, uh, denominations within a religion that are very welcoming to strangers, uh, partly because the, some religions do proselytize. So they, they want people to walk in. They want to share who they are and what their beliefs are with people who might be interested in, in learning more. Uh, there are other faiths that uh, aren't necessarily uh, uh, using uh, proselytization. They're not looking to convince people uh, to join, but as a as a convenience for their own congregants, they want to maintain an ease of access. Uh, and we should also keep in mind that a, a lot of houses of worship uh, day to day might not be very busy, and they might only attract a lot of people uh, on significant festivals. But the people who would uh, visit day to day might be older, retired people. Uh, because uh, in, in retirement, uh, joining various kinds of activities, study groups, things like that, is something that they will do. And again, as a convenience to congregants, you want to have ease of access and not have to uh, buzz people in or require people uh, to punch in a, a passcode. So it's a big balance. You know, one thing, certainly, with, with Jewish houses of worship around the world, including in the United States, is they tend to do have more security on significant festivals because that's when a lot of people will turn up. Uh, but but a regular Saturday worship, such as uh, this this incident in Texas, uh, you're not necessarily going to get a lot of congregants showing up for that, and uh, security might not be a high priority uh, because, again, you might expect only a small number of people to attend. Ross, um, let's move on now to uh, speak about Afia Sadiqi, uh, the lady who is... Uh, serving an 86-year-old sentence uh, at a Texas facility. Why is she such a rallying point? Well, it, it's certainly been uh, a case that, at the time, attracted attention in, in the Muslim world and, and specifically in Pakistan. And Pakistan politicians have followed this case quite closely, as have the media. But she was uh, accused of some very serious crimes uh, or, or participating in various terrorist activities in the period before she was arrested. And then while she was in detention, uh, she, she was involved in an incident uh, that led to charges related to possibly trying to kill uh, the interrogators. Uh, there, there was uh, access to a gun. And, and uh, again, she faced significant charges and she was convicted. And this is many years ago already. I'll have to be frank, uh, the, her case is not particularly well known, you know, say, outside of security analysts mm. or media who may have covered the war on terror. Uh, it's not particularly well known in the United States, notwithstanding that it's a significant case uh, for politicians or media in, in Pakistan. Uh, but uh, some people describe her case as a cause celeb and accusations of an unfair trial. Uh, you know, from the American perspective, uh, again, there's, there's very little uh, residents uh, for this kind of argument that uh, she had an unfair trial. Uh, you know, she was offered uh, lawyers in the absence of uh, being able to pay for her own lawyers. She rejected that. Uh, her conduct at trial uh, you know, did not uh, lend itself to a successful defense either. Uh, but again, generally speaking, her, her case is uh, not something that Americans are more familiar with uh, 
maybe by comparison, say, with some of the detainees at Guantanamo who might be a bit more high profile, whose cases are still uh, working their way through the uh, system. All right. Um, Ross Feingold, a U.S. affairs analyst, thank you very much indeed. And uh, just to uh, reiterate, the, US, the U.K. Secretary of State Liz Truss has called this an act of terror and uh, anti-Semitism. Lots of questions remain. <clears throat> Excuse me for my voice. And we will be following this story very closely.